Hello and welcome back. Today is the day that I'm doing my first mead video and um, I'm winging it here. So hopefully this video will be helpful. I am fairly new to making mead. I have some experience making wine years and years ago, um, but just recently got into making mead. And so this is my new passion. This is what I'm into. So I wanna share it with everybody. Um, so before I get started, Today, I am just moving me that I already started a couple weeks ago into new containers for aging, assuming they're ready, uh, that they're, I, I think it's a good time to do it. Um, so I'll get to that in a minute. But first, I just wanted to talk about very basic supplies that you need to make mead. First and foremost, well, a lot of them are first and foremost. Um, this is... Iostar, and this is for sanitization. You only need one ounce of this for five gallons of water. Um, I have over here a bin that I keep most of my supplies in, and I actually also use it as a container to put my sanitization fluid in. So I have a little line that I drew on here that shows where the five gallon mark is. Put an ounce of this in along with the water, mix it up, and I'm ready to go. So this is very first, because one of the key elements to making mead or wine or any kind of brew is sanitization, because you don't want bacteria to get in there and ruin everything. So that is one of the first things. Secondly, you need honey. And I don't have like a regular thing of honey right now. I just bought my first 10 pounds of honey from a local beekeeper that I'm really excited about. Um, this is clover and wildflower honey, and it's in a giant bucket. Um, so when I do a uh, brew from the very beginning, which I will for the next video that I do, um, we will be seeing this honey very soon. So the next item that you need base for basic mead is yeast. Now there's a lot of opinions floating around out there about what yeast is best. And I really think it probably just depends just like everything else. Like even if you try to reproduce the same thing over and over again, there could be something in the environment or the temperature or whatever that can impact and change the outcome. Um, but that said, I've had the most success so far with D47, this um, Lauvin, I think that's how you pronounce it, D47, which I believe is for white wine, typically. Another one that I've recently used is EC1118, which is for sparkling wines. And this one has an alcohol tolerance. So alcohol tolerance is basically how much output, um, how much the... I believe alcohol tolerance is how much alcohol can be in the environment before the yeast start to die off. And if I'm wrong, please correct me in the comments because like I said, I'm still new at this. But anyway, this is EC1118. And um, I've also made some wine with bread yeast. Bread yeast works as well. I have not done it with mead because, I don't know, I feel like it's too risky. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just me. Maybe at some point I will I will be less uh, risk resistant. Um, but yeast. So that's the next part. And then of course you need filtered water. You don't want to have water that has chlorine in it because that will impact the productivity of the yeast. And you want your yeast to be happy. This is why I'm into fermenting right now. I'm I'm really enjoying like taking care of my little yeasties. So um, then you also need a container. So some people, like if you're making something with say herbs or spices or fruit, um, a lot of times people will use a brew bucket. So this is a two, two gallon brew bucket, I believe. And I've used that to make a blueberry mead. And I think I also made a strawberry lemon ball mead in this and it works great. And then once the fermentation is done here, you can rack, it's called racking. So when you move the, the liquid from one container to another, it's called racking. It took me a minute to figure that out too. Anyway, there's a brew bucket for that, or you can just do it straight in your container. So I've been doing small batches 
for now. I recently bought a five gallon carboy, but this is a one gallon container carboy. Um, and so this is just a regular one, or you can get kind of like a mason jar, wide mouth. This is, I believe, a gallon as well. Oh, and look what's inside. The next thing on my list, <laughs> um, the next thing would be that you need are uh, airlocks. So once your fluid, your, your meat has started and you've pitched the yeast, which is what they call it when you put the yeast in, you're gonna have to have it sealed and keep the oxygen out um, and bugs or whatever else. Cause I don't know about you guys, but this summer has been a fruit fly summer and they love the smell of meat. So you want one of these um, and they get filled with fluid. I've been using sanitization fluid or vodka in here. And this is called a bung. And this is basically just a stopper that you put in your container and then the airlock goes in like that. For this one, you don't need a bung. It just has a hole in the lid and it goes in like that. And at, during this video, you'll see how that's done because once I rack the meads into a new container, I'm gonna have to put a new bung and airlock in. So where am I? Okay. So we got our containers, we got our airlocks, a uh, place for the yeast and uh, all the other ingredients to go to start your fermentation. So once you have your all your ingredients mixed together, the honey is mixed in to where it's no longer sticking to the edges of the container or on the spoon, if you're using a spoon to stir it, um, you'll want to take what's called a gravity reading. And this one, this uh, I did not do the first couple times because it seemed like, oh my gosh, no, I don't know how to use this stuff and this is so confusing. It's not that bad. Uh, <laughs> so what, what I have here is this called a hydrometer. I want to say hydrometer, but I think it's hydrometer. Um, and this is where you get your original gravity. So basically it's, you take your, your mead, and I'm going to be doing this in the video. You fill this container up, put this in, and it will tell you basically the buoyancy. I mean, I don't know if it's technically the buoyancy. It's the, the amount of sugars in the water. And you have to, there's all these different numbers on here and it makes it really confusing. So I will probably do a separate video just for this. Um, and it, it, it's, to me, it was intimidating, but once I figured it out, it's like, oh, that's, that's not bad. It's not that hard to do. Um, all you do is you drop it in there and you give it a good spin to get any bubbles off of it. And you can get your reading from this column here that has, starts with 0 0.9900. And then there's 1.0. I don't know if that, that's probably not gonna be visible to anybody, but it's on there. Um, you want to mark that down because in order to figure out what your alcohol volume is, you need this. So take your original reading and then today when I rack these, I'm going to take another reading to figure out what the alcohol content is so far in the meat. Um, so we'll get to that later. Make sure also that you write everything down. I'm finding that... Um, I actually started a spreadsheet to keep track of my, what ingredients I used, how much, you know, if I added more honey back in after fermentation, all of that, um, it's good to keep track. I just put a piece of masking tape right on the container and then just update it anytime I make any changes and add it to my spreadsheet. But the spreadsheet's fairly new. Um, yeah, so I think, oh, another thing that you need. So let's see, these are just other things that are nice to have. Um, I have a turkey baster, and this is to get the mead out of the container and to put into this beaker. So I'll be doing that later. Uh, I did purchase one of these. This is for degassing, which is still new to me, but basically all the gases, like the CO2 that builds up in your container during fermentation, um, when you rack it, you can get some of that gas off because it can make some of the smells and flavors a little unpleasant. Um, so if your mead is not aged very much or it's brand new, it might be a little funky. What I've found is it's always funky. 
So you have to let it age. Like I let it go a couple months and even just after a couple months, it's like, wow, this is really like the flavors start popping out again. It's great. So you got to be patient. It's so hard. But um, I do have a couple bottles that I've not drank. <laughs> so I could I could let it age for a good year. I think a year is going to be wonderful. So there's the stirring. I also use a spoon. I think a spoon's easier. This would not hook up to my drill the way it's supposed to. You can put it on a drill and it go. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Didn't work for me. Um, this is just a little mesh bag that I got. Uh, I do have been making a lot of fruit and um, herbal uh, meads. Uh, the fruit ones I believe are called melomels. And but I, what I'm really into the herbal mead, which is methaglin. Um, the ones that I'm doing now, I didn't use the bag, but this is nice to have. I haven't figured out which I prefer because um, it keeps some of the chunkies out of there. Um, a funnel. This funnel is the only funnel I have, and I need a new one because it's too small. I need a nice, like, metal one. But as it is right now, I have a little plastic funnel, so it makes it easier to pour your honey in and get your ingredients in without making a huge mess. Getting yourself one of these is helpful, too, um, especially if you drop your herbs and or fruit or whatever spices in the mead directly and you're racking it off. So I'm going to be using this one today just because I have little pieces of flour and whatever else that I poured, put directly into my mead floating around. Um, so I'm going to put it in here first and then put it into the new carboy and hopefully I will have less of the little floaties that way. Um, so this is very good to have. Uh, I got this on Amazon. I can link all of this stuff that I have uh, in the description for everybody. So if you do want to start making mead and want to get into this practice because it is fun, um, it would be easy. You can just click on the link and find exactly what you need. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go get my sanitization fluid all figured out. I'm going to fill up my bin and put some stuff in there and let it get cleaned off. You only need to put it in for a couple minutes. Um, and then we'll get started on racking. So I will be right back. All right, so I'm back. Um, I have my sanitization fluid. You can kind of see it right here in um, there's stuff soaking in there i'm now um, i have my containers drying and i'm going to move all this stuff <laughs> from here into uh, this pitcher but um i would probably normally have this sit a little bit longer i started this almost exactly two weeks ago. And I have a feeling it would be better to let it sit for a month, but I'm going to go ahead and take it off of these. See all of this. This is my Heather mead. I'm calling it my Scottish mead because it's Scottish Heather. Uh, and it has a long history in folk medicine. Uh, it has antiseptic, anti-inflammatory qualities. It can be used to treat arthritis and rheumatism and also has a mild sedative effect. Uh, and it can be used in cold care uh, as well as uh, urinary tract issues. So it has a lot of medicinal uses. I This is my first time playing around with it. Uh, I wanted it to, instead of making a tea out of it, which you can do to start a mead, an herbal mead, you can make a tea and then add the tea to the honey and water and yeast. But um, I wanted to have it be part of the fermentation process uh, just because. So I'm going to test it out this way. I might make it again as a tea and try it that way and see what works out better. But here we are with this big, messy situation here. So I'm going to take the airlock off. I put this rubber band on here because fermentation got off uh, to a really powerful start and I didn't want the cork to just go or the bung to just go and um, everything get exposed to the elements. We don't want that. So. I'm taking that off, and what I'm going to do here is this still has a bunch of, eh, not much on the inside, so I'm going to take my pitcher. When you use a siphon to move liquid from one container to another, you want the one that it's coming from 
to be a little bit higher than where it's going. So I'm going to set this up here on there and I will be right back. I'm going to go get my auto siphon and have at it. One more thing before I get going. <laughs> this is an auto siphon. So basically you have your tubing and there's this part that's hard plastic goes in to the pump. And when you're doing this, it is nice to have somebody else. I think it's nice to have someone else uh, helping so that, um, you know, one of these ends doesn't fall out of the container and create a huge mess because that is a potential here. So I'm going to try to do this just by myself, which I've done before I can do it. Um, anyway, you want to put the pump part only about halfway down initially. Um, and then there's all the sediment at the bottom in addition to what's at the top. So I'm just going to pump it a couple times and you'll see it'll start flowing in. And this is good to have too. Oh, see, I already got big chunks. So I'm glad I'm using um, this pitcher first because we don't want to. Yeah, this is going to be a big, a big messy one. So uh, I next time I might use my little mesh bag, but we'll see. Um, so while that's going, I am going to make this go zippity fast. Okay, so now that everything is racked into the pitcher here, I'm going to go ahead and take a gravity reading to calculate how alcoholic this is. And hopefully it has successfully fermented. Um, it has only been a couple weeks, so my guess is it will definitely ferment more in secondary, which is just the second container you put it in, I think. That's what that means. Um, and yeah, this is this has a lot of chunks in it. I mean, it would have some even if I... Yeah, it's still... And I haven't degassed it or anything like that. I probably am not going to this time just because I have two that I'm racking and trying to do this all in a limited amount of time. So you'll see I put, with this turkey baster, it is about six of these in here. And I'm just waiting for it to settle down and spin to where... Okay, and and this is not the easiest to read. I'm I'm not gonna lie. It's for me. Uh, we got two, four, six, one point oh three six. So it's definitely not done. Well, I can't say definitely, but it was still bubbling a little. So. That's kind of a sign that it, it's still fermenting. It could be from gases, but it hasn't been very long. So I'm going to go ahead and pour this back in. That's that's a whole nother thing. Apparently, some people don't pour it back in. I'm, I'm not going to worry about it. It has not impacted anything as far as I'm aware um, so far. So it's going back in there. What did I say it was? 1.036. So I had, I wrote on here, the original gravity was 1.13. So I'm going to just use my handy dandy phone here and calculate. Maybe I have it open already. No. Um, so I'm going to calculate the ABV right now. Um, there are calculators online that make this really easily. It, the hydrometer also comes with uh, um, an equation that you can use, but I find that just putting the numbers into a calculator are much, is much easier. So that's what I'm going to do. Why is this not? All right. So we had 1.13 to begin with, and now it is fermented down to 1.036. So we are already at a 12.34% alcohol. So this might be, I use the EC1118 and I believe it has an alcohol tolerance of 18%. So this stuff's gonna be, 
It's gonna be <laughs> it's gonna be strong, which I I kind of like my mead strong. I like around the fifteen percent range. Um, more bang for your buck, and you don't drink as much, and it's it's tasty. You can just savor it, and you get a nice little buzz. That's that's kind of what I'm into. So this is going to go into my one gallon wide mouth because I'm pretty sure there was not a full gallon in the original container to begin with. And as I can see here, yeah, it's it's like 16 ounces short of a gallon. So I'm gonna be putting it in here. Uh, everything's still kind of wet. I don't really, I don't really think it matters. Uh, the the uh, sanitization fluid is so watered down that it's not toxic at this point. It's highly toxic in its uh, condensed uh, concentrated form, but with all five gallons of water to one ounce, my understanding reading the instructions for IOSTAR, it is safe for, it's not going to like cause chemical burns or, you know, poison you or anything. So I'm just going to go ahead and put it in here. So I'm going to do the same racking process, but this time I'm going to put my pitcher up here and my new carboy down here and I will either speed it up or just cut this out. Okay, so I have just under a gallon here. I lost a little bit more uh, in the transfer over, but the next step here is I'm going to put my lid on. Pretty straightforward. Let me find. Okay, so since this thing is already full of sanitization fluid, um, there are these little markers on here that say maximum. So I'm going to go ahead and stick this little guy. The water is at the max level on each little section there. Make sure that's in good and that the lid's on nice and tight so that you don't get the, as little oxygen as possible in there. Um, in the initial, wait, hold on, let me, ugh. In the initial fermentation, you want to give your container a little swish every day to, to add oxygen. And when you're making your mead initially, it's good to shake it up and, and get oxygen in there for the yeast. But then for um, aging and uh, oxygen is bad. Uh, I might do another video on oxy oxygen. Oxygen is bad. And I'm going to leave it at that because I can't even say the word oxygenation. I think that's what it is. <laughs> anyway, it can spoil your meat or make it taste funky. Um, and what I found is young mead taste funky generally. I made one with hibiscus that tasted wonderful after like two, three weeks. That was unusual. Everything else that I've made, my initial reaction is, oh, you know, and feeling like, oh, I wouldn't give this to anybody. Um, give it a couple months. Like I said earlier, uh, I, I have high hopes for most of what I've made now, now that I've had made enough to have some of it age um, and start tasting really yummy. So, I'm going to go put this in my closet, which is where I keep everything in this office. I put it in the closet. It's nice and dark in there. And you see the bubbles already started. So the water in this chamber, just the pressure in here, pushed the water down and up into this one and a little bubble came. And so this already has pressure going. So I'm going to go ahead and put this in the dark closet. And that's where I keep everything. And the yeast seemed to like the temperature here. Um, I, the house is usually like, you know, in the low 70s. So I haven't had an issue with temperature yet. I'm sure as things uh, progress that I will, I'll get more sophisticated in that realm, but I'm not there yet. I'll be right back. Okay, so I'm doing another one because I had to, I just had to make two. Uh, going forward, I'm just going to do one uh, each month because this is, I have, a, I have a lot of mead going. <laughs> Um, this mead, oh, and before I forget, there was something I forgot to do. I forgot to bring my masking tape. Usually I write down 
the date that I racked it, what the original gravity was, and the current gravity, put it on the container, and then put it away. But since I didn't grab my tape, and I don't even have a pen, I'm going to have to do it afterwards and just rely on this video to remember the numbers. <laughs> Um, this next one is my Meadow Sweet, and I have this one. I have this one in a gallon and a half container. Um, that was because I wanted to actually have a full gallon, and I didn't want to have overflow. Um, so I kept it low. I mean, when the when the herbs were uh, dry, they went up to like the neck of this, and I've had a few blowouts, and that's a whole different video um uh, you can you have to get a tube and cr create a blow off tube and it's a whole thing so i wanted to avoid that that's why these are really low because the two batches prior to that overflowed in my closet so now i'm trying to just not put quite as much water and fluid in there and uh but that's not giving me as much mead Okay, so I'm gonna rack this one, and this is has this is what I'm calling my cold care mead. It has meadow sweet, elderflower, and rose hips. Now rose hips have vitamin C in them. That's kind of why I put that in there. Meadow sweet is one of the oldest herbs used for methaglins or herbal meads. Meadow sweet has um, similar chemicals to aspirin, so it's a good fever reducer, and it's throughout history has been used for. Um, that, just that. And then I added an elderflower, which I believe is good for upper respiratory, like sinuses. And so like if you already have the cold, elderflower is good at relieving the symptoms. And so I put them all together just cause I, I'm figuring it out. And this is kind of a fun experiment. So let me get to it. Uh, I gotta clean out my stuff. Hold on. Uh, another uh, point of advice here. Uh, when you are done with your container and they have all the sediment in the bottom, maybe clean them out right away, put them somewhere safe. Don't do what I do almost every time and put them somewhere where they get knocked over and make a big mess because that just happened. All right, here we go. Got my pitcher. Oh, I got my meadow sweet elderflower rose hip mead and I'm just going to take my auto siphon and move it from here to here. All right so I'm back. Uh, that was a big sloppy mess. I I wasn't paying attention and the tube that was pouring it into here flipped out and sprayed all over me and the floor but we made it and I still have if you can see right here I have just about a gallon so I didn't lose too much to debris and spillage, which is great, but I had to take my towel here and clean up. So I spilled the head, the empty Heather bottle, empty, it wasn't empty, it had stuff in it. So I spilled that over there, and then this sprayed all over me and the floor. So that's part of the fun of making me, <laughs> uh, like I said, if I have somebody around, I usually have the other person hold one end of the tube and that way you can avoid what I just did. But moving on, now I'm gonna take a gravity reading. Okay, so to do the direct gravity reading, we need to know what the original gravity was. So the original gravity on this was 1.11. Now I gotta put this somewhere where I'm not gonna knock it over. I'm just gonna put it back up here for now because Seems to be one of those days and I'm making all kinds of messes here. So I have my hydrometer in here and I'm gonna take my six little squirts. And this one also has a whole bunch of the uh, plant material floating around. Oh, I lost count. How many was that? Five? I'll just fill it up. Ooh. All right. Let's see what's going on here. Give it a little spin. 
and we got okay one point oh three two ish yeah i think 1.032 so i'm going to use my calculator on my phone again um and i'm going to type in those numbers so 1.11 was the original gravity so that's before fermentation and then now we're at 1.032 so it's probably similar to the well, that's not as exciting. I mean, 10% is just your basic wine. Uh, so 10% is just fine. Uh, I'm halfway joking about wanting it to be higher. <laughs> Only halfway. Uh, but right now it's at 10.24%. So chances are this is going to keep going uh, in secondary. So I'm going to go ahead and pour this carefully in. And we're going to move from the pitcher into my one gallon carboy. All right, so I got this racked and ready to go. I'm putting my little bung in there. <laughs> uh, and now I need an airlock. Okay, and I'm gonna use this kind of airlock. I filled it up to the fill line and it is ready to go. I'm just going to stick it in there. I'm going to get my tape and I'm going to label everything, put the information on there, update my spreadsheet, which I highly recommend to having some mechanism for keeping track of everything because if you get into it, it starts to become like, what did I do? I don't know, because there's other elements here that I have not included in this video. If you are interested in learning more about making mead and uh, specifically methaglins, but also I might be doing other kinds of meads too. And uh, please like and subscribe and join me next time on the for the upcoming new moon. I'm going to be starting my meads on the new moon, completing the meads or racking them or checking on them depending on where they're at on every full moon. And each video I will give uh, information on how to make the mead and also about the ingredients that I use. I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you next time. Thank you.